What if I told you Gojo's death had been sealed by chapter 1? And for 236 chapters, we were all just witnessing Sukuna's plan unfold in front of our very eyes. His promise to kill Gojo at the start of the series was just the beginning of it all. And the manga refers back to it in chapter 221 when they meet again. But how did Sukuna manage to achieve his goal? And what did Gojo mean by, I don't know if I'd have beaten him even without Megami's 10 shadows? Well, we have to first remember that Sukuna is the king that understands understands true jujutsu. He is the honored one that possesses divine techniques, and most importantly, he is him. Sukuna's knowledge allows him to break down the core of any technique, and after experiencing Gojo's Limitless in Chapter 1, something which was completely new to him, he immediately began concocting an intricate plan to kill the strongest sorcerer of the modern era. Gojo was living in his head rent-free. All Sukuna could think about was a way to counter infinity. But then, in Chapter 9, he had his Eureka moment, in the battle with none other than Megami Fushigoro. Whilst playing around with the young sorcerer, he realized something interesting about his curse technique in particular, and how his Shikigami was summoned. Unlike using talismans as per usual, Megami's technique allowed him to use the shadows as an intermediary to summon them. After witnessing this power, Sukuna instantly understood how broken it actually was, labelling it a great technique, as it was a much more practical method of summoning powerful Shikigami. Thus, he wanted to push Megami to the limit in order to witness the true potential of the Ten Shadows. When Megami does vow to go all out and makes the Sign to summon Maharaga, it's like a switch is flipped in Sukuna's head. He witnesses Megami's unique cursed energy and potential, which is later referred to in chapter 213. Sukuna tells us what he saw. I sensed that Megami had the cursed technique potential and tolerance to withstand me, unlike Yuji, who put him in a cage. Thus, he waited 204 chapters for the very moment Megami's soul would break and use this power for himself. Thus, Ten Shadows became the number one priority for him then on. As a result, the first step in Sukuna's plan was put into fruition. He had just the right idea to make this dream a reality. In chapter 11, after ripping out Yuji's heart, he struck a deal to bring him back to life. A binding vow, to be exact. Yuji tried to tease Sukuna, stating, Look at you, acting all big, but even you want to live. However, Sukuna calmly replied that the game has changed, and we will soon see something interesting, as he pictures Megami in his mind. Now, the conditions of this binding vow were as followed. One, Sukuna could take full control of Yuji's body for a minute when he said Enchain. And two, Yuji would forget all about the binding vow once it's agreed upon. Now, he wasn't too fond of this idea. I mean, after all, Yuji had seen that Sukuna truly was evil incarnate. Thus, he proposed another rule. Sukuna then promised that he wouldn't hurt anybody else for that one minute. With this being the case, a binding vow between the two was set in stone. Little did Yuji realize, though, that he had sealed the fate of not only his friend, but also his sense. Say. There was nothing he could do about it either. Even when Gojo questioned if Yuji had struck any deals with Sukuna in the afterlife, anticipating a potential binding vow, he of course couldn't remember a thing. At this point, step one of Sukuna's plan was complete. The only person he cared for was Megami. There was still one big uncertainty regarding this binding vow though, one that would make or break his entire plan, which we will get onto in just a bit. Because first, Sukuna had some important business business to attend to in Shibuya. Now, he didn't plan on resurrecting in this moment. However, due to the disaster curses and ghetto simps feeding Yuji some fingers while unconscious, Sukuna took over. This was not him using Enchain. Thus, the rules of the Binding Vow were null and void throughout Shibuya. Because of this, he enjoyed a vast killing spree, including none other than the special grade cursed spirit Jogo. He also killed the two girls for even thinking about bargaining with the king and didn't identify as a cursed spirit, so told them to However, the fun was just beginning for the King of Curses. With his return came Uraume, Sukuna's number one simp. But before the two could have a little catch-up about the last 1,000 years, Sukuna sensed Megami, and more importantly, his trump card for Gojo be summoned, Mahoraga. He swiftly told Uraume that he had urgent business to attend to, and not to worry, as it wouldn't be long until he was completely free. In the meantime, she was ordered to begin preparations. Preparations for what exactly, well, 
of course, the Kudaku ritual, which we witness in chapter 216. However, elsewhere, Megami trapped Shigemo in the ritual with him to battle the unbeatable Shikigami. Mahalaga immediately one-shot Megami, leaving the weakling to fend for himself all alone. That was until the King of Curses showed up, noticing Megami's state of suspended death. With just one look at what's happening, Sukuna mentions how it was a good idea to spare his life back in chapter 9. He used RCT on the lifeless body as he couldn't afford to lose Megami, and so for that very reason, he had to keep Shigemo alive too, because if either of them died to Maharaga, the exorcism would come to an end, killing both of them. From this moment forward, if his decision to make Megami his prized possession wasn't proving to be a good one already, he was about to get everything Sukuna ever needed to ensure he would win in a battle against Satoru Gojo. This was because Sukuna learned firsthand just how amazing Maharaga was, as it would have straight up killed him there and then had it not been for Yuji's body protecting him, as the positive cursed energy imbued with the sword of extermination would have killed any cursed spirit. That's not the part Sukuna was interested in though. He wanted Maharaga's ability to adapt to any technique with this simple turn of a wheel. This meant it could effortlessly counter any cursed technique as well as adapt to its own cursed energy according to the opponent. The only way to defeat such a being was to kill it before it could adapt to an attack, meaning Sukuna had to unleash his domain expansion, Malevolent Shrine, onto the Shikigami to stand any chance of victory. And so, mission success. Step 2 of Sukuna's plan was complete. He had his trump card to bypass Gojo's infinity. Sukuna even alluded to this himself all the way back in chapter 118 when he said, You showed me the way, Megami Fushigoro. With the information we have now, this line has been completely recontextualized. However, Sukuna wasn't done yet. There were still two more integral steps in his plan to defeat Satoru freaking Gojo. You see, Sukuna was done with Yuji. Thus, he had hatched the perfect plan to ditch his ass. But it was a big gamble. It all relied on Yuji being, well, as Sukuna puts it, a dumbass. Now maybe you're wondering, well, why didn't Sukuna just take Megami's body there and then as he wasn't under the Binding Vow's conditions? Well, this just puts into perspective how fast and how far ahead Sukuna thinks. He knows that if he wants Megami to truly be his, he'd have to break him emotionally. And for that to happen, Sukuna needed patience. During the culling games following the sealing of Gojo inside the prison realm, Megami finally conjured up enough points to save his sister Sumiki from danger and fulfill his goal. He wanted nothing more than to just save her as she was sick from being cursed. Little did he realise though that he too was cursed in the culling games. In chapter 173 after his battle with Reggie, the ancient sorcerer cursed Megami by asking fate to toy with him until he died. And it's safe to say that from that moment onwards, luck wouldn't really be going his way again. With Megami and the gang finally getting enough points to get Sumiki out of this mess, it looked like everything was about to be over. Sumiki would be safe, Angel could get rid of Yuji and Sukuna, free Gojo and happy days. All would be fine and dandy. They even mentioned how things were going well, but Gege said, huh, yeah right. Sumiki suddenly used the points they had given her to add a new rule to the culling games that allowed entry to and from different colonies. This was all Megami needed to know to understand that he was no longer looking at his sister. The true identity of the woman standing before him was an even bigger simp for Sukuna than Araume. It was the ancient sorcerer Yorizu. All of Megami's efforts proved to be for nothing. Thus, Sukuna was ready to enact step three of his plan to eliminate Satoru Gojo. Break Megami. As Yorizu flew away, Yuji and Hanakurasu set off to stop her. However, seeing everything happening around him gave Sukuna the utmost perfect time to finally make use of that binding vow he made with Yuji. And chain. He immediately defeated Hanakurusu with one swift movement. What came next, however, was a huge gamble, as I said. He needed Yuji to be selfless enough to not include himself in the deal when he said Sukuna can't hurt anyone during his one minute of freedom. And as it turned out, luck was on the King of Curses' side. He tore off his vessel's finger with no consequence, meaning he could force feed it to Megami Fushiguro before he could summon General Mahoraga. It 
had worked. Sukuna had finally ditched Yuji for his dream vessel as he reminded him what he said back in chapter 11. Remember when I said that we'd see something interesting, boy? Thing is, simply identifying that Megumi had the potential and curse technique tolerance to be a one in a million vessel wasn't the be all and end all for Sukuna. There was still one more issue, and that was if Megumi would be the same as Itadori and act as a cage for Sukuna rather than a vessel. Otherwise, feeding a single finger would be worthless. Instead, he had to be sure he completely and utterly destroyed Megami's soul to the point where his will to live was all but gone. We learn in chapter 212 that a reincarnated sorcerer gained all immediate memories of their vessel, allowing them to instantly use their abilities as seen by Sukuna's instant mastery of the Ten Shadows when he called forth a kaiju-sized Nui, as well as also masquerade as that person by copying their mannerisms. This is how Yorozu huh? tricked Megami in the culling games, as well as how Sukuna tricked Hanakurasu, as he acted like Megami to lure her in close so that he could gobble her up. After all, she posed a huge risk to his mission with the cursed technique Jacob's Ladder. One of the memories Sukuna also gained would have put the nail in the coffin regarding his decision to target Megami thanks to what Gojo said about how a Ten Shadows user had killed a Six Eyes Limitless Sorcerer in the past. That being said, Sukuna soon realised that his goal of acquiring Megami's body was far from over, as the young sorcerer began fighting back by restricting the King of Curse's cursed energy output during a battle with Yuji and Maki. Thus, it was time to see the outcome of Araume's preparations that Sukuna got her to make back in chapter 117. It was bath time. This bath was a Kotaku ritual to turn objects into cursed tools by submerging them in pure cursed energy with a mixture of various organisms for 10 months and 10 days. This originates from Japanese mythology, where a cursed technique that uses insects and other small creatures like lizards to create a poison. They sealed the creatures in a small jar and let them butcher each other until just one survived. Last creature standing is thought to be the host of a curse. This brings us back to Sukuna, who is the truly enlightened one. He's also the curse and Megumi the host. However, in this case, to speed up the process, Uraume used an enhanced ritual where instead of small creatures, they're using cursed spirits. Now, in ordinary circumstances, a cursed spirit would just turn to dust upon death. However, thanks to Uraume's ice technique, she could freeze the core and keep its spirit alive so that she could crush its corpse and create the bath. With this bath made, those that are submerged inside would become as close to evil as humanly possible, taking Sukuna one step closer to his true Heian era status. Yet despite that, he's content with retaining Megami's outside appearance. Why? Well, as he said, it's better for fighting sorcerers. One reason for this further proves Sukuna's genius in strategic planning for battle, because as we saw later with the fight against Kashimo, Sukuna purposefully stopped himself from changing form as it was a get out of jail free card that he could use to completely heal himself without using RCT. Thus, we can deduce that Sukuna refrained from transforming this early in the story because he anticipated losing his RCT against Gojo. However, the main reason he wanted to keep Megami's face was much more sinister. Despite the bath purifying his body and giving Sukuna more freedom with Megami, it wasn't enough. Sukuna needed assurance that the body belonged to him if he wanted any hope of defeating Satoru Gojo. By killing Megami's sister with his own body whilst he had no choice but to just sit and watch was the kind of evil act that would crush Megami's soul beyond repair. And after his bath, Sukuna was feeling especially evil. Thus, he took advantage of Yorozu's rule to switch colonies and immediately headed out to fight her. Much to her displeasure, he refrained from using Malevolent Shrine as Sukuna understood that using Megami's own ten shadows to kill his sister would be the most efficient way to send him into despair and weaken his resolve. Plus, it let him completely master it to use later against Gojo. But there was more to this fight than just sinking Megami's soul. It gave Sukuna the chance to give General Maharaga a suitable test drive. And boy, did he. As Yorozu trapped him in her domain, Maharaga came out and destroyed her perfect sphere. After all, Sukuna's 1000 years worth of experience and knowledge of all Jujutsu meant that he understood exactly how her energy based techniques functioned, meaning he had adapted to fighting attacks such as this long ago. This level of adaptability to create contingencies by understanding everything about his opponent was key in him facing Gojo, as from the very first time they met, Sukuna began analyzing his intent 
infinity. Within seconds of experiencing it, he deduced that speed wasn't the source of Gojo's power and that it was something more. He witnessed everything Yuji had as well and used that information to counter Unlimited Void as he experienced it against Jogo. However, Sukuna now had the tools ready to combat that infinity, bringing us onto the fourth and final step of his elaborate plan to shake up the balance of the Jujutsu world as we know it. Roll on December 24th, 2018. The Battle of Shinjuku. In hindsight, we can revisit this fight and understand that Gojo was right when he said that Sukuna wasn't even going all out. For example, take a look at chapter 230. Following their domain battle, Gojo states that he's happy to see Sukuna tryharding. Yet, the King of Curses rebukes this claim, stating that he isn't trying anywhere near as hard as Gojo was. And well, he's spitting facts. Even Gojo wondered why Sukuna kept taking a riskier plan in their ongoing fight and gambling on every occasion throughout. For example, Gojo states the whole time Sukuna's been avoiding any other technique other than the one engraved in his domain. He's constantly giving Gojo the upper hand, but for what? Well, we come to find that it was to adapt to Limitless, and he did. It was all in the name of evolution, upgrading his cursed technique. Chapter 236 confirms that Sukuna was simply waiting and waiting the entire fight until there was an opportunity for him to copy Maharaga's ability. The first time Maharaga bypassed infinity, it altered the essence of its own cursed energy. Sukuna knew that this wouldn't work for him, thus he simply passed the time fighting until a more suitable option presented itself, that option being exactly what Sukuna was waiting for. He understood that Maharaga wasn't just simply sending aimless slashes, rather it was aiming for the space, worlds and existence around Gojo instead. This would normally be near impossible to replicate, but as we know, Sukuna is that guy. He beat fire with fire against Jogo after copying it, plus he understands the core of cursed energy better than anyone, and so he used Maharaga as the perfect model to evolve his dismantling cleave by allowing him to slice space itself finally completing his plan from chapter one. Now, if you want to enjoy more peak fiction and find out how Yuji became a demon god calamity and gained Sukuna's powers, you need to click on this video right here.